Well, welcome again. This is uh, 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 another session here. We're going to be reading from the book of Luke, chapter 1. And I know I'm, maybe some of you might see I got a new haircut. Let me know what you think, if it's uh, if you like it better this way or if you like, uh, uh, you like me in long hair better. Uh, just leave some comments. So what we're going to be talking about here is... Uh, John the Baptist, the birth of John the Baptist. This is one of the chapters uh, that I am very, very excited to get into because there is a very key verse in here. And I'm going to get to it and um, I'm going to show you what it is. It's something that every Christian should know and every Christian should, uh, should be well aware of. Let's start out here in Luke chapter 1, verse 1. Since many have undertaken to set in order a narrative concerning those matters which have been fulfilled among us, even as though who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and servants of the word delivered them to us, it seemed good to me also, having traced the course of all things accurately from the first, to write to you in order, most excellent Theophilus, that you might know the certainty concerning the things which you were instructed. There was in the days of Herod, the king of Judea, a certain priest named Zecharias. Now in the Hebrew, that would be Zechariah, Zechariah, of the priestly division of Abijah, or Abiah. He had a wife of the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elishabet, or Elizabeth. Now here is the key verse, verse 6. They both, they were both righteous before God. Now some people don't believe that it's possible to be righteous before God. Okay? They were both righteous before God, walking blamelessly in how many of the commandments? How many of the commandments? In all the commandments and ordinances of the Lord. Now, let me, let me stop here. Now, this completely blows out of the water a lot of Christian theology, especially the theology that you cannot fully obey the law of God, that the law of God is just too perfect to obey and that you sin all the time and then therefore you don't even, shouldn't even try to obey the, Lord, the law of God. That's why Jesus came is, is, to, is to so-called fulfill the law or obey the law for us so that we really don't have to obey, so that we can be just lawless devils and still go to heaven. That's not what the Bible says. That's not what the scriptures say here. Let's read it again. Verse 6. They, again, this is speaking about Zechariah and Elizabeth. They were both righteous before God. Not sinners. Not sinners saved by grace. They were both righteous before God, walking blamelessly in all the commands. How many of the commandments? My Bible says all. If your, if your Bible says all, you better believe it was all the commandments and ordinances of the Lord. Okay? So yes, it is possible to live righteous and obey all the commandments of the Lord. I, I've said this many times before and I'll say it again. There are many Christians, for example, just in America alone, that claim that they are, or like to believe they are, uh, law-abiding citizens, you know, in regards to the law of the land, that, that they're not criminals, that they don't break the law of the land. They are law-abiding citizens. They are good citizens of the country. But did you know that there are so many laws... In, let's, in America alone, there are so many laws that lawyers don't even know the exact number. They say it's about 4 million. They estimate it to be about 4 million laws. So then Christians, a lot of, a lot of Christians claim that they are law-abiding. They, they abide by all 4 million laws. 
However, when it comes to the law of God, they say, oh, no, that's, that's too much. It's too strict. We can't do it. That's only 613 laws in the Torah. And of those 613 laws, only a few actually apply to the common man. A lot of them apply to priests. A lot of them apply to men only. Some of them apply to women only. Some of them apply to children. Okay, so only a matter of just a few, let's say a couple hundred at the most, commandments apply to you, commandments of God, the law of God, and yet you don't don't even try to obey that, but you yet you really try to obey the law of the land because you think it's God's will to be a law-abiding Christian, a law-abiding citizen of your country. Hypocrite. It's just hypocrisy. If there is any law you should be obeying, it's the law of God above all other laws. Because the law of God is not burdensome. It, it, as, as John says in his epistle, the commandments of the Lord are not burdensome. That's exactly what, what was John talking about. He's talking about exactly what Moses said in Deuteronomy chapter 30. After all of the law of Moses came down. At the very end, wrapping it up, you know, tying up the, the loose ends, so to speak, Moses said, actually God said, the commandments that I'm giving you are not too hard to obey. You don't have to climb up into heaven to get it. You don't have to dig down into the core of the earth to, to obey God. No, it's right there in your mouth, in your heart. It's right there for you to take. The kingdom of God is at hand. It is easy to obey God's commands, okay? So God is not a tyrant. God is not uh, abusive in the sense of giving you commandments that you just cannot. It's just impossible for you to obey. He's not like that. He gives you commands that you are able to obey. You know, he's not unreasonable. And of those commandments, it is a shame that most Christians say that they will not or cannot obey those commandments. God intended for you to obey. He didn't tell his beloved people for thousands of years to obey commandments that he knew that they could not obey. That's not his heart. That's not the way he works. That's not the way, that's not the way it goes down with God, okay? Uh, when Yeshua came, when Jesus came on the earth, he said, look at me, I am, when you see me, you've seen the Father, okay? I represent, I'm a full representation of the Father. So, yes, um, the commandments of God are easy. God didn't give you anything that is too hard for you to obey. Just as it says in the scriptures, the temptations that you go through are not too hard that you cannot resist them. God always provides a way out, okay? This verse is key. Remember this throughout the rest of your Christian walk. Luke chapter 1, verse 6. Totally, totally, totally blows out of the water the old Christian myth, if, I'm, if I can use the word myth, or the old Christian fable, untrue fable that God's commandments cannot be fully obeyed. All of, God, all of God's commandments cannot be fully obeyed. Yes, they can. People have done it throughout the ages. There are many people throughout the Bible that have, that's, it says they obeyed God blamelessly. It says Job obeyed God blamelessly. It says Zechariah and Elizabeth here obeyed God blamelessly. That means not one commandment they, they broke. Not one. Even Paul the Apostle, the Apostle of Grace, the Apostle whose writings a lot of Christians use to, 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 uh, to oppose the law of God. A lot of, a lot of Christians use Paul's uh, writings to say that we don't have to obey the law of God, that we can't obey the law of God. That's not true. You look at the book of Philippians where Paul, uh, Paul said very explicitly, I am righteous in regards to the law of God, blameless. He's blameless in regards to the law of God. He did not and does not obey or disobey any commands. He, he fully obeys the law of God is what Paul said. So, I always, I always remember Luke chapter 1, verse 6. You can, 
they did obey blamelessly all, not most, not 99%, but all the commandments and ordinances of God. Verse 7, but they had no child because Elizabeth was barren and they both were well advanced in years. Now, while he executed the priest's office before God in order to in, in the order of his division, according to the custom of the priest's office, his lot was to enter into the temple of the Lord and burn incense. The whole multitude of the people were praying outside at the, alt, at the hour of incense. An angel of the Lord appeared to him, standing at the right side of the altar of incense. Zechariah was troubled when he saw him, and fear fell upon him. Isn't that interesting? Most of the time when angels appear to people, they get terrified. They get really afraid. An angel uh, can appear in a very, uh, a very um, fear, fearful way, you know, in a very fearful form. Uh, maybe the angel was, was very large. Maybe the angel was um, very fearful looking. Maybe he had a sword in his hand. Who knows what happened here? Verse uh, 13, but the angel said to him, don't be afraid, Zacharias. You notice this is another, another uh, th- common thread throughout the scripture. When, when, when an angel shows up or when God appears or when the Lord appears to people, a lot of times, if not all the time, they are afraid. And um, he always says, do not be afraid. Okay. So yes, when you really, really, really meet God, when you really know the real Lord Jesus Christ, it's a fearful thing. If you have never experienced a fearful uh, visitation or a fearful experience with, with the Lord Jesus Christ, I seriously question whether or not you have really experienced the true, real Jesus Christ of the Bible. So again, verse 13, but the angel said to him, don't be afraid, Zacharias, because your request has been heard. Your wife, Elizabeth, will bear you a son and you shall call you. You shall call his name John. Okay. now, again, this is a a Greek transliteration of the excuse me, an English transliteration of the Greek transliteration of the Hebrew, which is Yochanan. Okay, or Yahukanan. Again, down the stream, downstream, it translates from it transliterates from the Hebrew to the Greek to the English, and finally we get the word as we ha- we know of today as John. A little side note here: I know a lot of you know it, and I know I've said this before, but um, the J sound J is not found in the original Hebrew. Okay, no Hebrew name actually had the j sound in it. So John, you know, J- Jacob, these kind of things it wasn't like that at all. It was uh, more of a ya. Yeah, a, um, again, John was, uh, his real name is Yochanan. Uh, Jacob's real name, for example, was Yaakov. Okay, so uh, it's very interesting to know exactly, you know, uh, what the original Hebrew actually uh, said and how it was pronounced. Verse 14, you will have joy and gladness and many will rejoice at his birth for he will be great in the sight of the Lord. Remember Jesus said that John the Baptist is the greatest that was ever born among women. Isn't that the greatest man that ever was born? Isn't that quite the statement? So the angel said here, he will be great in the sight of the Lord and he will drink no wine nor strong drink. He will be filled with the Holy Spirit even from his mother's womb. Now here we got a, we got clear evidence that John the Baptist was uh, under the Nazarite vow. Okay. In, in the script, in the book of Numbers, we read about the Nazarite vow. And in that Nazarite vow, uh, they're not supposed to drink any grape juice, any wine, uh, anything, even eat, eat grapes or even eat the seeds or the skins or anything like that. Plus, they are supposed to let their hair grow. Um, and uh, there's other other um, things as well that they are supposed to uh, they are supposed to adhere to. Uh, John here, like Samson, was under the Nazarite vow. 
And the Nazarite vow, for those of you who are not familiar, is a vow that is kind of like, for the most part, now John is an, is an exception, Samson is an exception, but for the most part, the Nazarite vow uh, was taken, it was optional, it was taken, you know, um, in your own free will uh, for a time that uh, that you would be comfortable with. Like some people might ha- take the Nazarite vow for a week, some might take it for a month, a year, 10 years, uh, whatever you want. But people like John here, people like Samson, and I also believe that Jesus himself was under the Nazarite vow. That's why he didn't drink of the uh, the fruit of the vine at, at the, uh, the, the Last Supper, uh, the Passover. Um, but yes, this is a sign that he that these people were under the Nazarite vow, which is basically an optional, like again, sometimes mandatory, uh, vow that places you at the very pinnacle of holiness. Okay, um, if you're going to obey Torah, you can you can just obey Torah. Like as a Gentile, you'd come in under the Noahide laws, so to speak, as as it's outlined in um, Acts chapter 15. If you want to go a little bit further, and you're, it's expected actually that you learn more of the law of God and that you learn more about God. And as you learn, you, you're more responsible and you obey more of God in that sense. And so you, you, you grow, okay? You grow and grow and grow. But then there's the opt-in, you know, kind of like the turbo or nitro holiness, okay? which is the Nazarite vow, which is the holiest of holy um, uh, statuses you can have with God when you're under that vow. John here was under that vow, I believe, according to this evidence that we have before our eyes. Verse 16, speaking of John, the Baptist, that is, he will turn away, or he will turn many of the children of Israel to the Lord their God. He will go before him in the spirit and power of Elijah, Eliyahu. This is powerful, my my friends. This is powerful, okay? John the Baptist, okay, he he was come in the spirit and power of Elijah, that's a lot of power. If you know about Elijah in the Old Testament, so-called Old Testament, um, Elijah exhibited a lot of power, calling down fire from heaven. Uh, I mean, lots of stuff going on in Elijah's life. He was a very, very powerful prophet of God, one of the most powerful prophets of God. In fact, he didn't even die. He was taken up into heaven by uh, chariots of fire. Okay, so he will go before him in the spirit and power of Elijah. Why? How? Here we go. To turn the hearts of the fathers to the children. Okay, and that's in Malachi 4, 6. That is a very important and very, very vital thing uh, for those who are uh, true followers of God, true children of God, to fall into. You need to have the hearts of the fathers turn to the children and the children to the fathers. Okay? The hearts of the fathers turn to the children and the hearts of the children turn to the fathers. Once that when, once that happens, my dear friends, then God moves mightily. Then you you actually make and prepare the way of the Lord in your life. Our our society today, our world today is really, really lacking in this. There's a lot of people whose hearts uh, have not turned to their children and their children's hearts have not turned to the heart to their fathers, which absolutely is vital for everyone, everyone in God's kingdom. So that was what John was doing here, according to this, to prepare the way of the Lord, to turn the hearts of the children to the fathers, To turn the hearts of the fathers to the children, okay? As you read Malachi 4, 6, you'll see that in context, and that's exactly what it says. And the disobedient, to the wisdom of the just, to prepare a people prepared for the Lord. Again, this is very, very important to understand. 
A lot of a lot of you might have, you know, you see people on TV, you you go to church or whatever, you say, "Oh, I know someone came to the Lord. They 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 uh they say this they said they said the sinner's prayer and now they're saved. You know, they went forward to the altar and and all this kind of stuff." But if you really want to prepare yourself for the Lord, if you're really serious about preparing your heart and yourself for the Lord, you have to make sure that your that the hearts of the fathers are turned to the children and the hearts of the children are turned to the fathers, according to Malachi 4.6. And the disobedient to the wisdom of the just to prepare a people prepared for the Lord. If you're a pastor and you're listening to this, you need to do this. This needs to be a priority in your uh, in your community. This needs to be a priority in your circle of fellowship. To turn the hearts of the fathers to children, hold them responsible, preach what how a father really should be a father. You know, not just a man who goes to work and comes home and 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 is just the breadwinner of the family. No, but a real father whose heart is really turned to the children. And the children, their hearts should be turned to their father. Why? To prepare a people prepared for the Lord. Verse 18, Zechariah said to the angel, how can I be sure of this? Oh, good question. <laughs> How can I be sure of this? I mean, give me, uh, put it in writing, okay? <laughs> kind of thing, you know? For I am an old man, and my wife is well advanced in years. Verse 19. The angel answered him, the angel answered him I am Gabriel. Wow. Who stands in the presence of God. I was sent to speak to you and to bring you this good news. Behold, you will be silent and not able to speak until the day that these things will happen, because you didn't believe my words, which will be fulfilled in their proper time. The people were waiting for Zechariah, and they marveled. They were amazed that he delayed in the temple. When he came out, he could not speak to them. They perceived that he had seen a vision in the temple. He continued making signs to them, remaining mute. When the days of his service were fulfilled, he departed to his house. After these days, Elizabeth, his wife, conceived, and she hid herself five months, saying, Thus has the Lord done to me in the days in which I looked which he looked at me, to take away my reproach among men. Why would she have reproach? Reproach is like a bad thing, and that people would look at you in a bad way. Why would she have reproach? Well, because she didn't have children. People wondered, probably wondered, what's going on with her? Why did God withhold children from her? Why didn't God bless her with children? So... When she got pregnant, she said, you know, again, verse 25, Thus has the Lord done to me in the days in which he looked at me. In other words, he blessed me. To take away my reproach among men. So that now she's blessed. Verse 26, Now in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth. To a virgin pledged to be married to a man whose name was Yosef of David's house or David's house. The virgin's name was Miriam. A lot of people know her today as Mary. Having come in, the angel said to her, Rejoice, you highly favored one. The Lord is with you. Blessed are you among women. But when she saw him, she was greatly troubled at the saying and considered what kind of salutation this might be. Again, there's someone else that was troubled when when the angel when an angel came to uh, to her. Okay, so again, this is a pattern. Verse thirty: The angel said to her, "Don't be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. Favor. Behold, you will conceive in your womb. This is favor. She will get." She will have a baby. 
and give birth to a son and shall call his name Jesus. Or in the Hebrew, Yahshua. Also known as Yahushua. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father, David. Now, isn't that interesting? That right off the bat, the angel said that his father is David. No, well, his father is Joseph. Was well, father's David. But his ancestor was David. So way down the years, of hundreds of years, if not over, about a thousand years before, before the time, David existed. Yet, Yeshua, Jesus, is David's son. So it's like all of the, you know, David, you know, had this son, which had that son, which had the other son, which had this son, which had, and down through the genealogy. It's like everybody between David and Jesus was kind of just a link between Jesus and David, and that Jesus was actually the son of David. I actually heard that there was uh, one uh, Jewish person that said that Jesus can't be the Messiah because he's not the son of David. You look at this. You look at the history. Okay, that uh, right from the right from con before he was conceived, he was called the son of David. When he came out of the womb, when he was when he was uh, you know an adult, everybody called him not everybody, but a lot of people called him the son of David, and nobody refuted that. Nobody refuted that he, because he was the son of David. They knew his genealogy. Verse 33, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. There will be no end to his kingdom. Whoo, wow, what a thing to hear from an angel that you're going to give birth to a son. And this is the kind of son you will have. A king of an everlasting kingdom that will never have an end. Miriam said to the angel, how can this be since seeing I am a virgin? She, she wasn't married. Um, she wasn't with a man. The angel answered her, The Holy Spirit will come on you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the Holy One who was born from you will be called the Son of God. Now, a lot of Muslims have a problem with this. They say that uh, they think that the Holy Spirit, you know, basically... That Mary had some kind of uh, strange, uh, you know, affair here or something. It was, uh, listen, God is a spirit. The Holy Spirit is God's spirit, is God. He doesn't have to, you know, um, he doesn't have to have Jesus conceived in the exact same way as, as a flesh, blood and flesh man would, would, would be in, in that sense. God can cause that seed, that, uh, you know, fertilization to happen in Mary's womb just by speaking the word. He created the earth. He created the universe. God created everything. It's no hard thing for God to create a seed inside of Mary that would be, or even just create, um, uh, what do you call it, um, her, her egg to be fertilized. Um, yeah, so verse, verse 36. Behold, Elizabeth, Elizabeth, or Elizabeth, your relative, has uh, also has conceived a son in her own age. And this is the sixth month with, uh, with her who is who was called barren. For nothing spoken by God is impossible. Or, it says here in the notes, for everything spoken by God is possible. And again, this is not through some kind of intercourse, okay? God spoke and it happened, okay? God spoke and it happened. He's, he, it was the seed, his seed that was implanted into Mary by his word. Verse 38. Mary said, Behold the servant of the Lord. 
Let it be done to me according to your word. Then the angel departed from her. Mary arose in those days and went into the hill country with haste into the city of Judah and entered into the house of Zechariah, Zechariah or Zacharias, and greeted Elizabeth. When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the baby leaped in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the, with the Holy Spirit. Again, a lot of people don't believe that people, uh, some Christians don't think that, that people were actually filled with the Spirit of God before the book of Acts. Yes, they were. They were. There's several explicit incidences here where people were actually filled with the Spirit of God before the book of Acts. Here also, we can see that the baby was actually aware of what was going on. Uh, the baby inside Elizabeth's womb, John, was actually aware that he met Jesus. He met at least Miriam, okay, uh, the mother of the Lord. Um, so the baby leaped in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. Babies in the womb are human beings that see, that, I mean, they, at least they can hear, they can feel, they can understand they can have joy they are human beings and i must add anybody who kills one of these precious babies is guilty of bloodshed verse 42 she called out with a loud voice and said blessed are you among women and blessed is the fruit of your womb why am i so favored that the mother of my lord should come to me for behold, when the voice of your greeting came into my ears, the baby leaped in my womb for joy. Blessed is she who, bl who believed, for there will be a fulfillment of the things which has been spoken to her from the Lord. Yeah, so again, the baby, when she heard the greeting of Miriam, uh, leaped in, uh, in the womb for joy. Uh, again, this is, a lot of people know it, but a lot of people just don't want to, <laughs> don't want to acknowledge it. But the babies that are in the womb are people who actually see, I mean, see to, some, one, to a certain degree, uh, degree, hear especially, and feel, uh, have emotions. They're just like anybody else. It's just they're, they're just in a different uh, location. They're on the inside of the skin and not the outside of the skin. Verse 46, Mary said, My soul magnifies the Lord. My spirit has rejoiced in God my Savior. For he has looked, upon, looked at the humble state of his servant. I have to stop here and say, again, over and over through, throughout Scripture, you will read, God opposes the proud. God hates pride. But he gives grace to the humble, to the truly humble people. For he has looked at the humble state of his servant. For behold, for now, from now on, all generations will call me blessed. You know, some people don't know what humility is. Mary said here that all generations will call me blessed. Some people might say, oh, isn't that an arrogant thing to say? Oh, isn't that a proudful thing to say? No, it's not. She's humble. She humbly receives the word of God. A lot of you, when you hear the word of God, I mean, how many people tremble at the word of God? As it says, we should tremble at the word of God. It, it says that in I, Isaiah. Some of you, when you hear the word of God, you get angry instead of trembling and being humble. No. No. You should not be angry. You should be humble. Mary was humble. Miriam was humble. And because she was humble, she knew that all generations would call her blessed. Verse 49. For he who is mighty has done great things for me. Holy is his name. His mercy is for generations and generations on those who fear him. He has shown strength with his arm. Now, again, let me just back up a step here. Verse 50, his mercy is on, does it say everybody? 
Hello? A lot of people believe it is. It says his mercy is for generations and generations on those who fear him. There's a condition here. Those who fear God. If you fear God, you don't want to sin against him. Verse 51. He has shown strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in the imagination of their hearts. Again, he has scattered the proud in the imaginations of their hearts. God, may you do the same thing today. Scatter those who are involved in the people who are proud, people who are that just have a lot of pride. God, as you says, as you said here, and according to the holy scriptures of God, the most well, they say it's the best selling book of all time, the, the Bible says he had scattered the proud in the imagination of their hearts. And God continued to do that. Verse 52, he has put down princes from their thrones. You're a judge, you're a prince, you think you got something, you think you're big and mighty, God can put you down in an instant. He has done it to many and he will do it to many more. And, the, and has exalted the lowly. You want to be exalted just as Jesus said. You want to be lifted up on high. You want to be, you know, exalted. You want to be well spoken of. You want to be looked up at, you know, you want people to look up, look up to you. Be lowly. Be lowly. Not proud. Humble. Verse 53, he has filled the hungry with good things. It's important to be humble and lowly and hungry. He has sent the rich away empty. He has given help to Israel, his servant, that he might remember mercy and has spoken to our fathers as he has spoken to our fathers, to Abraham and to his offspring or seed forever. Miriam stayed with her about three months and then returned to her house. Now the time that Elizabeth should give birth was fulfilled. And she gave birth to a son. Her neighbors and her relatives heard that the Lord had magnified his mercy toward her. And they rejoiced with her. That's good neighbors, isn't it? Good neighbors that they rejoice with her instead of putting her down and gossiping about her and slandering her and trying to do things against her. No. They rejoiced with her. Isn't that the way to go? Uh, Verse 59. On the eighth day, they came to circumcise the child, you know, according to the Torah. And they would have called him Zechariah, okay, or Zechariah who? After the name of his father. His mother answered, not so. He will be called Yochanan, John. They said to her, there is no one among your relatives who is called by this name. They made signs to his father that uh, what he would have him called. And he asked for a writing tablet and wrote, his name is Yochanan. They all marveled. His mouth was opened immediately and his tongue freed and he spoke, blessing God. Fear came upon all who lived around them. And all these sayings were were talked about throughout all the hill country of Judea. Imagine that. We, we read about it over and over and over again throughout the scriptures, from cover to cover, how fear comes upon people when God shows up. How fear comes upon, as it says in the, in the book of Acts, fear fell upon the church. But my friend, where is the fear of God today? Because we don't really serve. (laughs) So many Christians do not really serve the God of the Bible. They serve a golden calf Jesus. They serve a golden calf Jesus that is nothing but an idol. Nothing but an idol. Not the true Jesus of the Bible. It's more like a golden calf. It looks beautiful. Oh, look how pretty Jesus is, sweet Jesus. 
It just sits there and adorns their, their, in their hearts. It adorns their life, never rebuking anybody for their sin, never changing anybody's life from a sinner to a saint, no power, just a golden calf, a golden calf Jesus. We need the real Jesus, the real Jesus of the Bible, the Jesus that causes people to be afraid. As it says here, God, when God shows up, be it by an angel or be it by himself, people are afraid, I'm telling you. Fear came upon all those who lived around them because of God's work, because of God, what God did. Is God working like that in your church? Honest question. And all these sayings were talked about throughout all the hill country of Judea. All who heard them laid them up in their hearts, saying, What then will this child be? The hand of the Lord was with him. His father, Zechariah, or Zechariah, was filled with the Holy Spirit. Again, there's somebody here filled with the Holy Spirit before the book of Acts. And prophesied, saying, Blessed be the Lord, God, the God of Israel, for he has visited and redeemed his people and has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David. As he spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets, whom, uh, whom, he, uh, whom have been from of old, salvation from our enemies and from the hand of all who hate us. Don't we need that? If my dear friend, if people don't hate you, I don't know where you are in God. You might not even be in the right place with God if you don't have people who hate you. When you are in the right place with the Lord, people will hate you. But salvation, God will give you salvation from your enemies and from the hand of all those who hate you. To show mercy toward our fathers, to remember his holy covenant, the oath which he swore to Abraham our father, to grant to us that we, being delivered out of the hand of our enemies, should serve him without fear. In other words, don't be afraid of men. As it says in the book of Proverbs, the fear of man is a snare. It's a trap. In holiness and righteousness before him all the days of our life, and you, child, will be called a prophet of the Most High, for you will go before the face of the Lord to prepare his ways. How? To turn the hearts of the children to the Father. To turn the hearts of the fathers to their children. To turn those who have been bound in foolishness to wisdom. To, to turn those who have been bound in sin to righteousness. Verse 77, to give knowledge of salvation to his people by the remission of their sins. Because of the tender mercy of our God, which has been by which the dawn from on high will visit us, to shine on those who sit in darkness and the shadow of death, to guide our feet in, into the way of peace. The child was growing and becoming strong in spirit. May you, may every one of you be strong in spirit. And was in the desert until the day of his public appearance to Israel. So may God bless the reading of, his, of this, these scriptures, give you insight, open the eyes of your heart, your understanding to know things that you did not even know were possible to know. And it's, as it says here, may God make you strong in spirit. So once again, as you go thinking about this and meditating about this, God bless you richly and mightily. Thanks again for watching.